Welcome back 907 on our Thursday morning. It's not every day you get the opportunity to sit down and chat with NASA astronauts or even hear advice from them for future space explorers. And today, though, we will be hearing from someone who did have that chance. But before we get to see those interviews, we want to hear a little behind the scenes. So joining us this morning is Dr. Oase Durrani to tell us about this month's STEM City episode. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So tell us about what it was like to speak with multiple astronauts. It was surreal. Like every one of us as a kid is at some point wanted to be an astronaut. Right. Like just grinning the whole time, asking them some <laughs> some probably lame questions for them, and then some kind of more difficult questions. The four I speak with initially are actually going to go to the moon next year, orbit, and come back. So they're part of the Artemis II mission. Wow. Yeah. And so last year was Artemis One, where they sent an em empty uh, spacecraft right? yeah, to space, absolutely. and then so this is going to be the first time they're going to send a manned mission, and they're going to be on that. And so we actually got to go in the Orion spacecraft, and they showed me where their kitchen was, where the bathroom is going to be, where they're all going to be sitting, and um, I was right in there with him. So, so you super got to surreal. go inside. Yeah, wow, that yeah, axis we were all in there. is so cool. How small is it? It, it's pretty tight. It's it funny because I like before going in there, I was like, oh, are all of us going to go in there? And they're like, yeah, we're all going on the mission. We <laughs> have to live there together. <laughs> exactly. If we don't fit in there, that's a problem. So, what is, yeah. Like when we say it's pretty tight, is it like shoulder to shoulder? It's, so when the seats are in, it's yeah. shoulder to shoulder. They actually take the seats out when they're in space because it's hard to stay seated in space because there's no right. gravity. Yeah. So when you take the seats out and fold those in, there's a little more room. So I would say cool. probably kind of where, where this table is about that much space. Nice. That's yeah. not much. No. Uh, what was one of the things that they told you that really surprised you the most? So I think one of the cool things was they all have s different backgrounds. Some of them are PhD, some of them are engineers, some of them went to military, but they all ended up as astronauts. Mm -hmm. And so it was this kind of, you know, story for each one of them that there's no like linear path right. to getting to where you want to get to. They all kind of took their branches and turns and whatnot and now they get to go to space. Yeah. And so I think that's important for all of us, you know, going to various careers, keeping that in mind. Especially when we're talking about STEM yeah. specifically. You know, we that's one Takes thing we've showcased. Experiences yes. and knowledge. There's not one linear path to do one specific thing. Uh, you know, you talk about moving around in space and how they've removed this seats because it's it's tough to stay in one spot what did they comment on sleeping in space what that's like they did yeah so they it's basically sleeping bags that are either on the roof or on the sides of uh, the platforms and whatnot and it doesn't matter because there's no gravity so if you could be linear upward sideways so and they I'm have like, to that's got to be great for your spine <laughs> right <laughs> yeah or like i'm thinking of like a like a head rush i don't but and then they, that doesn't happen, right? They even have to like strap down their heads because their head would kind of float off the pillow. Oh, so. you could r run into something. You could literally right. run into something yeah. while you're sleeping. Yeah. So you have to be like strapped down. Wow. <laughs> how are they gonna? How are they gonna get food? Like, what? What did they talk about for? So they've got like these like alive. MREs essentially, these little packets with like various like things like enchiladas and mac and cheese and whatnot. And uh, Megan MacArthur, who is the chief science officer at Space Center Houston, talked to me about that. And that's really cool because she is an astronaut, but she also serves in this role in communicating science and space to us as a community. So she talked about the various food options. There were some when I some when I asked about her, she was like, yeah, I don't I want to stay away from that one. But I think enchiladas were her favorite. Oh, wow. yeah. So I am glad to hear that you did ask some of these questions right. because, yeah, I yeah. feel like a little kid, like, oh, tell me more. Tell Geeking me, out tell about me this, how you right? eat and sleep. Yeah. And I know that they're doing some phenomenal work with, you know, science and technology. So, it, yeah, I feel it's like so sometimes incredible. my questions feel juvenile, I but I have two little boys, too, who also would be fascinated to learn yeah. how that works. It was cool because there was like five-year-olds and eight-year-olds running yeah. up to them and wanting yeah. to take I pictures, that. but I was just as excited <laughs> as those <laughs> kids were. Yeah. Just a little weirder. Yeah, just as a little far weirder. As like, can I take a picture with you? No, you're not weird at all. <laughs> okay, we want to take, we want to go ahead and take a look at the conversation that you had with them, right? Yeah. Let's do it. Today we're at Johnson Space Center and I'm inside the Orion spacecraft. We're about to chat with the four astronauts who are going to fly this thing to the moon and back. Let's go chat with them. I'm Jeremy Hansen, a mission specialist in Artemis II. 
Uh, I was inspired to be an astronaut by seeing a photo of Neil Armstrong standing on the moon. My mom tells me it was around five at the time, and uh, I turned my treehouse into a spaceship and never really looked back. And I studied uh, space science in the physics department in university. I'm the pilot for the Artemis II mission, and uh, about 10 years old, I saw a space shuttle launch on television, and I didn't really say that I wanted to be an astronaut, I said I want to fly that thing. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's where it started, and I studied general engineering in college. I'm a mission specialist on Artemis II. I have wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember, so I'm not sure exactly when it started, and I studied physics and electrical engineering in college. Reed Wiseman, I will be their personal assistant, so whatever they need, I will attempt to do. Um, I studied computer engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for my major in college and as I had grown up I wanted to drive trains and then I wanted to fly planes and then I saw a space shuttle launch and I was wanted to fly a space shuttle and then I wanted to be an astronaut so it, I didn't grow up that way but I came to that after a couple of years. One thing everyone gets excited about is you guys right you guys show up to a school or a Formula One race or around a politician and everyone's excited They're, that's kind of universal and I'm excited by that because you guys obviously as y'all talked about all have science backgrounds and so you guys are the embodiment of science and STEM careers. Why do you think that is? Why do you think when you show up when NASA shows up when their mission comes up everyone is over the moon? We're explorers and we have seen something or we will see something that people are curious about and they have dreamt about it at some point in their life. We've all stood on Earth and looked out at the moon. We've all dreamt about the moon in some capacity. So I think it just piques your curiosity. You just want to meet them and say hello and see what they're doing. You went to Antarctica and did research. The rest of you guys flew fighter jets. That's not the first thing that comes to mind when you say, hey, I'm going to major in engineering when you're in, in, fresh, in freshman year of college. What along the way made you realize that, hey, you know, this path that may be linear that everyone follows isn't the only path. And then there's, there's other offshoots that could be fun and exciting and, you know, show me new, new, new things. For me, I remember distinctly when I realized that I was at space camp and I was in a class called How to Become an Astronaut. And they literally wrote a list up on the board with check boxes. And I thought, wow, if this is ever going to happen to me, it's not going to be because I followed that list. If you live your life, through a set of check boxes, your life becomes in a box, and that wasn't for me. I took a very unconventional path. I had a lot of people question my decision to leave a perfectly good engineering job at NASA after I graduated and go to the South Pole for a year, and it turned out to be the path that I was passionate about that brought me fulfillment and that eventually led me here. Diversity, you know, makes things better, but just kind of in the, in the lens of this mission, how is your team going to be able to function better and be better because of all the different experiences Experiences that you guys bring to, to the table. One thing I would say is one thing we've understood for quite a while now in the space program is we can go further together if we collaborate and set big goals and we're just seeing the results not of a decision that was made in April we're seeing a, results of decisions that have been made over decades to slowly evolve how we approach problem solving the big problems that really matter and just this innate understanding for us that this is simply the best way to do it. Just set big goals, bring the best people who have the best ideas to the forefront to accomplish it. And we're just four examples and a huge team is extremely diverse. When you dig into the details of how we're really gonna get to the moon and back, it's overwhelming. And we're gonna get there because of an extraordinary team. You know, actually I'm headed to my alma mater today after the end of my work day today and I'm going back to speak uh, to our wrestling team and I, I'm going to tell some of these stories but I showed up and I was wrestling division one and I was taking engineering at the university level and I suck at that both of them. I mean it was so hard. I was not prepared for either but I stayed at it and that's one of the lessons I want to communicate uh, is that it's it is so important to have some stick to itiveness because anything you practice you get better at and that is I mean this is what I talk to my kids about. I've got two kids in college and so anything you practice you will get better at. And so that first uh, physics class that I took at Cal Poly, it kicked my butt, but I kicked the next one's butt, you know? And so I think it's important to have a little bit of comeback in you, no matter what you want to do, technical and athletics. You know, for example, when you think about sports, most of us understand this with sports. You go to the gym and you put weight on the bar, right? You put on resistance because it's going to make you stronger. When you go to you know, differential equations for the first time or linear programming and you walk in a classroom and you see a board of no numbers, it's all words and it's a math class, that'll be daunting. But if you practice it, you'll get better. And so that resistance is where we grow from. And so I think it's important for, for youngsters to remember that.
Going through high school for me, I, I learned a lot of physics, I learned chemistry, and I was studying algebra, and I got just a little bit into calculus, but I really didn't, they were all just new concepts, and I didn't really see how all of this fit together. And just by luck, I get to college, and I start to see how calculus works into differential equations and into modeling systems, and then I see how calculus plays into physics. And for me, this world that I lived in as a high school student for years of just a lot of math, but I didn't really see the focus of it all. I then got to more advanced subjects and I started to see how our whole world feeds into these solutions. I started to see how are these formulas created that I've used and applied. Now I know what the background is for those. And that, for me, it, my love of math did not get discovered until my sophomore, junior year of college and I got into these advanced classes. So if, if you kind of like math and you like that procedure, there can be a whole world of discovery out there when you start to bring all of this into focus. Stay tuned when later on we go inside the Orion spacecraft and get a tour with the four astronauts that will be traveling to the moon. But before that, we're going to head over to Space Center Houston and chat with astronaut and chief science officer Megan MacArthur about Space Center Houston's role in sharing space with our community. Well, Megan, thanks so much for joining us on STEM City. I'm not going to do injustice to your CV, so give us a quick <laughs> one-liner on who you are and what you do. Sure. I am Megan MacArthur. I'm a NASA astronaut, and I'm the chief science officer here at Space Center Houston. You studied oceanography. You studied engineering. Um, how did you come to studying those things when you were growing up and picking those two things? Well, my dad was a, a naval aviator, so he flew airplanes in the U.S. Navy. So I grew up moving all around the world, living on different air bases, going to lots of air shows with my dad. And, and aviation museums. So I fell in love with airplanes and uh, from the time I was about seven years old I said I wanted to be a pilot like my dad when I grew up. And then when I was a teenager we lived at a Navy base that shared a space with Ames Research Center, a NASA center, and I would see astronauts come and, and train there and I thought well that's a real job, that, that job looks like fun. So I decided to study aerospace engineering in college and I did that and I, I learned a tremendous amount, I had a great amount of fun, um, but I got involved with the project as engineering students do oftentimes to build something weird. So we built a submarine, a human powered submarine. And in the process I got certified to scuba dive because I was the pilot for the submarine. And then I got very interested in ocean engineering. So I ended up kind of taking a little bit of a step off the main path maybe and, and pursuing that interest and that passion for a while in oceanography. But always with the idea in the back of my mind that I'd really love to be an astronaut one day. People think of it as a pipeline, like I've yeah. got to get in right here and if I don't do this right here I'm never going to get to the other end. But we really like to say it's more of a pathway, right? You can step on and off the path. There's lots of different branching you know ways to go um, and, and so I, I want people to think about what are the different opportunities that you see along the way that spark your interest um, that might go to a totally different place than you were expecting but might take you back to the place you were imagining. So you apply to be an astronaut obviously insanely hard to get it when you get that what does training look like how long is it what are the days like? Well training is a, it's usually a couple of years we call it astronaut candidate training once you've been selected and it covers a whole variety of things so you learn how to operate the spacecraft whatever the spacecraft is that we're operating at the time. For me, it was the space shuttle and the space station. Now, of course, we have other vehicles that go to the space station. But you learn how to, you know, the systems, the engineering, how it was built, how we operate it, how we interact with it as astronauts. But then you have to learn how to do all the tasks that astronauts do, right? So there's spacewalking, there's robotic operations, and then, of course, there's science. And so we get training in all of those things, what I would call kind of basic training. And really, a big part of it is learning to work together as a team, not just with other astronauts, but with all of the engineers and operators that are helping you do the mission in space. So you're the chief science officer here at Space Center Houston. What does that mean? Well, you know, when I was in space the last time, which I can't believe it now, it's been two years ago, yeah. I started to think about what do I want to do next? Um, and I really love the part of my job that is sharing with the public about what I get to do, you know, on their behalf in space. And I love to see people light up, right, when they yeah. hear, when they can make a connection, something that makes sense to them, something they can picture themselves doing. So I thought, how can I do that kind of in a more, a, a bigger scale, right? And I had the opportunity to speak to William Harris, who's the president and CEO here, and he talks about Space Center Houston. We bring people in space closer together, and I thought, that's what that's what I want to do. I want to contribute to that. So we developed this opportunity where I get to basically contribute to the authenticity of the programming. I get to help with the strategic planning, thinking about what is it that we want to share with people? How do we want to welcome people in to make them feel like, yes, we have space. We have space for you here. We have space for everyone. I think of space as kind of like 
a gateway science, right? So people who maybe don't think of themselves as a science person, they're excited about space. They're yeah. expi excited about exploration. And whether it's the big discoveries that we might be making or just imagining themselves, like, how am I going to brush my teeth in space? Yeah. People can connect with you in a new way. And I love that we, that we do that here, that we provide that place here. Awesome. So I always love doing the hands-on stuff. So this is food that astronauts eat in space. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So you can imagine when you go live in space, you don't have access to the grocery store, right? We don't even really have a big refrigerator to keep food. So we have to um, have what we call shelf-stable food, sort of like canned food. I'm sure you have canned food yeah. at home in your pantry. And so we have a great team right across the street at Johnson Space Center that runs a food lab. And they think a lot about how can we provide nutritious meals that are also interesting, right? Flavorful that yeah. meet, you know, all of the different requirements. And so they've been developing, you know, food over the years and they're packaging it in different ways. So one way of packaging it, it looks like this. So this would basically be similar to canned food. This is actually beef enchilada, which is actually a pretty good dish on orbit. Um, <laughs> again, pretty flavorful. Yeah. And so we would take something like this, we would put it in a little warming oven that we have. Okay. And then you just cut this pouch open and you have your spoon and you just eat it right out of the pouch. This is a sleeping bag, um, but you have a little, it's like a little closet, right? You yeah. could go in and close the door and turn the lights out. And um, then you'd have a sleeping bag that was kind of pinned to really any wall. So for me, my sleep station was actually in the ceiling. Okay. But of course it feels the same to me. Yeah. It doesn't feel like I'm on the ceiling. It feels the same as if I was here. So you climb into the sleeping bag, you zip yourself in. You can actually use this to strap your head against your pillow so that your head is not sort of floating around, yeah. right? And you can tuck your arms in because otherwise, of course, they'll they'll float up in front of you. So final question as your role as chief science officer. We have a asteroid sample here, I believe, right? OSIRIS-REx. Yes. Uh, tell us about that. What's the significance of that? And wh yes. why, why did we get an asteroid sample? Oh my goodness. So Johnson Space Center, as you know, right across the street, and we are the official visitor center for Johnson Space Center. The Astro Materials Curation Facility is right there. And so yeah. this sample is being preserved and curated um, for scientists to use now, as well as, you know, decades and you know even farther into the future as we build more tools to understand what it is that we have. And so we are going to be one of three institutions around the world that has a sample that the public can come and view, which I think is just amazing that we have this piece of asteroid. It took seven years to launch a spacecraft to get there, to figure out how to fly around it and come in and take a sample, bring it home again. And this asteroid is, you know, four and a half billion years old, which is, you know, about the age of the solar system. It's about the age of the Earth. There are um, theories that say asteroids are what seeded the, the, the building blocks for life on our planet. Yeah. And so we think that by studying this asteroid, we can learn, you know, what did it potentially, not this particular asteroid, but what could asteroids have contributed to building life on Earth? So it's very exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to see, you know, what the team comes up with. Yeah, so, so awesome. And thanks for everything you do in pr promoting STEM education and sharing space with everyone and inspiring kids. And thanks for your time. Thanks, Elise. It's been great chatting with you. Likewise. These chairs fold like after launch and when you're, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. so they'll fold. They fold them. and they also okay. have pieces that are removable. So okay. just the back can be here and the bucket can be taken out and we'll stick all the hardware down there. Okay. And then speaking of sleeping, would you probably sleep in this or no? There's going to be other kind of yeah. um, sleeping bags. Sleeping bags. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you'll just be kind of in your own. Stretched out. Yeah. Kind of. What people don't realize, it's actually really hard to be in a seat in space. You have to work really hard to like, like these will just be not helpful at all. Yeah. That's why they're getting kind of demolished. Okay, and then fifth grade me's got to ask, what's the restroom situation? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be right in here. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's an extremely on. small phone booth. Um, okay. So would you go down in there, or is it something that comes up? Okay. You go down in it. So okay. there's a door, so you have some privacy. And then would you um, probably be in the same like suits for the entire duration of the mission, or no? You would be able to change and whatnot. Okay. That's... We'll just be in regular t-shirts and stuff. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we'll launch and re-enter in the orange yeah. uh, pressure suits. Okay. In case of emergency. Yeah. Hopefully we never have to use their function. Yeah. And then the rest of the time we'll just be hanging out. No okay. clothes, yeah. regular clothes. Eating situation? Uh, like You're standing on the kitchen. Oh, yep. sorry. Yep. Right there. <laughs>
Yeah, so obviously we've got some panels here and whatnot. I kind of see three screens. Are they touch screen or are they kind of controlled by the buttons next to them? The buttons yeah, and, and uh, levers, you've got okay. uh, a cursor controller device here so we can actually run the cursor that's up there and do commanding and uh, change displays with our hands without touching the screens, but yeah. there are also controllers up here that we can use. Okay. And then it looks like there's a hatch up there. Is that where y'all would, uh, what, what is that for, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, docking hatch. Docking eventually. Hatch. For us, yeah. it won't be outfitted with the docking yeah. um, hardware, but eventually it will be a docking hatch. And it is a hatch that we could use in a contingency once we land if, for any reason, we wouldn't be able to use the side hatch. Okay. And then what, what is the total length <coughs> of the mission from launch to back home? Yeah, between nine and ten days. Nine and ten days. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, one final question for each one of you. thing you're most excited about for this mission? <laughs> Splashdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And same answers for everyone coming back. <laughs> well, I, we, I mean, honestly, yeah. there's there's so many parts of this mission that we're excited for. Yeah. The neat thing will be when we come home, what was the one thing that like just took our breath away, I think, in the whole thing. I, I do have to say it's a bit cliche, but right now we are working with the flight control team that flew Artemis 1 last year and getting to work with these people that operated that vehicle. It was on crew to test flight the depth of their knowledge, the professionalism that they bring. I, it's just so fun to work with them. It's fun to see the people that are building our vehicle. It's fun to dream a little bit about being 38,000 miles from Earth and looking at it and then being 250,000 miles from Earth and looking at it. It's fun to dream about going around the far side of the moon. And it is really, like we all dream about hearing three good mains from Mission Control <laughs> on the way back when our parachutes deploy and we're heading to the Pacific Ocean to splash down. And you get that feeling of like, yes, mission accomplished. What an awesome day chatting with four really smart, really kind and really humble people that also happen to be going to the moon. Thanks to Johnson Space Center for having us. And we can't wait to see you next month on STEM City. Love your reports. That's a, that's so phenomenal. Awesome. I mean, you got really like behind the scenes access to like the most amazing things. One of the most amazing things that this country has to offer. Yeah, I'm still pinching myself. <laughs> right. I got to like go behind the scenes and talk to all, all of them and show and tell and ask them all the questions yeah. I had and it was an amazing. Were experience. any questions off limits? No, they they said ask us anything and I did ask them anything. One of the questions um, I was like, you know, the pilot Victor Glover. I was like, oh, how did you get to be the pilot? And I was kind of focusing on that. And they said we all get to fly it, but we also get to do all the other tasks. Yeah. So they all have to like clean the bathroom, they all have to do maintenance, they all mm -hmm. have to do like the grunt work of it, but yeah. then do the cool stuff as well. And that kind of made me realize as well, like all of our jobs has some kind of mundane component to it. Of course. And that's okay, even if you're going to space and going to the moon, you're gonna have some mundane components to your job, mm -hmm. but then you get to do some awesome things that's as well. That's a great point, and that like everybody kind of has to move up in ranks too. I mean, you have to know how to do everybody else's job if you're gonna do you know yeah. the thing that you really yeah. want to do. They're all intertwined. It's a team effort. It's a it's a group it's a group sport. It's 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 pretty cool to see this. Their excitement is contagious yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, you can't help but want to know more and hear more and and be there. And as it so. was airing, you said they're just really down to earth people. Yeah, it was just like you walk into a bar and meet some cool people and talk with them and that's what it was, but they're also astronauts and they're going to the moon. <laughs> Love that's that. That's so cool. What are you what are you most excited for going forward with their with their mission? Anything that you're ex that they told you about that maybe you're excited to see go, come full circle? Just like when I was walking around the Space Center with them, all the kids running up to them, all that excitement. It seems like when I was growing up, obviously in Houston there's yeah. that excitement, mm -hmm. but maybe there was like a little lull in space exploration, but mm -hmm. it feels like we're back in the 60s and 70s yeah. with that excitement level. We're going back to the moon, we're talking about Mars, there's private space. And so just seeing that a whole new generation of kids gets to experience that and then yeah, us, us as well, as that's well, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And to be able to say that you were there, you were in this vehicle that's going to be making history yeah. after You know, the cool thing years. about your reports airing on KPRC, too, is that we also were the station that brought the moon landing to people's homes yeah. in Houston. So this is a real, like, full circle, yeah, full circle Houston moment. history moment, too. Yeah, we get to be a small, small part of it. <laughs> yeah, well, thank Very you so cool. much for joining us. We love having you on. Yeah, thank you so much.